Greetings, everyone. And thank you for joining us this evening uh, to hear Dr. Alan uh, Corbier speak as part of our IIE series and as part of National Treaties Reconcil Recognition Week. My name is Ted Christou. I'm the Associate Dean of Graduate Studies and Research, and it's my pleasure to um, start um, <laughs> the ceremonies today. Uh, and uh, I've been tasked with the responsibility of acknowledging the territory and um, which is no small task on, on a week uh, such as this. To acknowledge this traditional territory is to recognize its longer history, which predates the establishment of the earliest European colonies. It is also to acknowledge this territory's significance for indigenous peoples who lived and who continue to live upon it and whose practices and spiritualities were tied to the land and continue to develop in, in relationship to the territory and its other inhabitants today. It is my understanding that this territory uh, is included in the Dish With One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Iroquois Confederacy and the Confederacy of the Ojibwe and Allied Nations to peaceably share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. I would like to also acknowledge that Kingston was a part of the Crawford Purchase. Now, little is actually known about this as no written treaty or detailed descriptions of the agreement survive. The Kingston Indigenous community continues to reflect the area's Anishinaabek and Haudenosaunee roots. There's also a significant Métis community as well as First Peoples from other nations across Turtle Island present here today. Reflecting on the current Indigenous rights that are being violated from coast to, to coast to coast demonstrates that these treaties are not resigned to history. Rather, they reveal continuing practices of colonization. Understanding the contexts, impacts, and implementations of these treaties is critical for reconciliation. I'd like to personally thank Liv Rondeau and Becca Carnival and our elder Deb saint Amand for their support in crafting these words, Miigwech. And now Deb saint Amand will welcome you and uh, our speaker to this gathering. Annie Bojo, I am um, so honored to get to introduce Dr. Alan Corbier um, tonight. He's from Chiging First Nation on Manitoulin Island, and he's uh, in the Department of History at New York University. He's a well-known lecturer, historian, keynote speaker. Um, I've seen him speak many times about the Treaty of Niagara. I've seen him um, talking about language revitalization. I've seen him at Indigenous Ed conferences, and every time I learn um, something new, and I, I know that in my um, role as trying to learn the language when I, I get stuck and I ask people like, how would you say this? Like one of the people I quite often ask is Kimmy D and she always says, I'm gonna ask Alan Corbier because he'll know the answer. So yes, I, I'm so thrilled that you're here tonight to share your knowledge with um, everyone gathered here today online. Miigwech. So my turn. Okay. Nin saojik benen do dem mam pim chiging don jaba chinan dam dashgi be wiki jio ne goa we be dabata maga joe bak mam pi she came in a sing. Chemioja dash the mishumsa benik minwa jagana shak giwa win the matawat eje be matzoat. I wanted to, I'm, I'm happy that you asked me to come and talk. And I, from what I understand, I'll be speaking to teachers. Uh, uh, what I understood is I'll be t talking to teachers, new teach or teachers in training rather. So I didn't want to make this too sp uh, specific to one treaty. And then uh, I also wanted to have a broad enough that uh, wherever they're coming from, they could relate to it. So I'll, uh, I'll share my screen, but before then, I, I did have to say in, uh, in Ojibwe that um, uh, my Nishnabe name is Ojik, and that means the fisher, and my clan is the Bine, that's the rough gross, and I'm from Chiging. Uh, and then I'm happy to come here and, uh, and talk about this, some of this treaty. Uh, there's a lot to talk about, and sometimes, uh, I don't get through everything.
This is a, a close-up of a wampum belt. And the diamond usually represents a nation on these wampum belts. And that white road in the middle, we call that the road. Uh, and it goes right through the whole of the belt. And they call that the road of peace. And uh, you'll see later on, uh, I'll explain some a bit more. This is a, a whelk shell. And in the middle of that shell is a, is a kind of a core. Uh, and that's where we get the white wampum or where they used to get the white wampum and still do. So if you see that kind of shell on the sea, if you pick it up and you're able to get the middle part, then that's where you'll get this white wampum, these white wampum beads. The other shell there is a quayog, and you see that purple shell uh, on the rim. It used to, I've been told by a couple of people that this quayog used to grow larger, uh, but now due to environmental conditions, they don't grow as large as they used to, and they don't get as old as they used to. So the, the beads aren't as deep purple as they used to be. So you see on that belt in the background, how sometimes uh, you see some of the beads are actually so purple that they look black. And when you do some uh, archival research, sometimes you'll say, it'll say in the records, gave a black belt. And of course it isn't about karate, it's, uh, it's about the, how deep purple these uh, beads are. This is called a calumet pipe. They call it a calumet. The, the, the stem uh, is actually what they would say from your heart out. And if you held your arm out to the end of your arm and sometimes longer. So about uh, sometimes about two feet long. So they're longer than the pipe stems we use today. But uh, the, the bowl itself, of course, many of you will have had these kind of teachings before. So I don't think I'm... Uh, uh, transgressing any taboos in explaining this a bit, that the, the pipe bowl, of course, is stone. And then that stone represents the earth. And then that that stem, that pipe stem, we call it okich in our language, kijiatik, and uh, that is the pipe stem. And then the uh, bowl, poaganesin, and then the eagle feathers that are affixed to it, sometimes they put a whole wing to it. But in this case, this is uh, they have just uh, four, uh, five eagle feathers. But sometimes, it'll be, usually it's seven. Uh, and it's usually the tail feathers. And then sometimes they'll have wampum on that as well. So usually when we talk about this, the, the pipe itself is also a mnemonic device. And this is what I want to talk about today a bit, is the symbolism that our, our ancestors used. So that eagle, some of you may have heard uh, elders talk about this, that that eagle is the one who flies the highest. And then also that the eagle is the one who uh, saved us long ago. And that he's the one who collects the prayers from your pipes in the morning, or if you burn that tobacco in a fire in the morning. And then the smoke from that tobacco is the prayer. And this eagle is the one that is said to collect all those and then take them up to the creator. And then you, when you have that wampum there, wampum, of course, grows or uh, is uh, on the bottom of the ocean floor. So what we say then is that these promises that were made with this pipe actually goes from right from the bottom of the ocean all the way up through the sky as high as the eagle flies and right to the creator. And we say when they smoked that pipe that and made that fire, that the smoke from that fire and the smoke from that pipe went all the way up to the creator. And that's why we say that these treaties, the majority of them are sacred and that they were done under the, the watchful eye of the sun, meaning the creator. So that's what these uh, the symbolism means on this uh, this calumet with the pipe stem, the bowl, of course the trees are represented with that, and then also the tree of life. So there's more that uh, could talk about with this, but I'll, uh, I just got an hour. 
This is a chief from our area. He's uh, actually from Gittagan Zibing, which is called uh, Garden River in English. And that's, uh, that reserve is close to Bao Ting, which is called Sault Ste. Marie in French. Anyway, Jungwa Kons is a uh, little pine. And maybe some of you have heard of that story, recreation story. And when that, when that Nanabo Jo, he killed that underwater being and that underwater being caused the flood, the world to flood. And then Nanabush uh, ran up top a mountain and then uh, to, the water started to rise and in order to avoid drowning, he climbed a tree on top of that hill. And then as he climbed that tree, it actually, uh, the water continued to rise. And then they, he said to that tree, stretch, my brother, stretch. And that was a pine tree that he was on. And that's why you, if you look at through a forest, as you're, even if you're driving along, you'll notice the uh, pine trees are taller than the rest. And that was uh, part of that. So when, when he has this name, Jingua Kons, it represents that potential, the potential to grow that high. Anyway, this is, these are two, he was recorded two, not, he was recorded more than this, but these are two of my favorite uh, quotes from him that are attributed to him, written in English, of course, uh, but he, he just spoke Ojibwe. And in uh, St. Joseph's Island, 1829, he, he held a few strings of wampum and said, Father, the great master of life gave us pipes and wampum for the purpose of conveying our ideas from man to man. And then again in 1852, he said, uh, Father, we salute you. We beg you to believe what we say, for though we cannot put down our thoughts on paper as you, our wampums and the records of our old men are as undying as your writings, and they do not deceive. So he's talking about wampum and pipes and the strings of wampum, but also the use of our memory. And, uh, and he also says that our wampum and pipes on old records do not deceive. Again, we, I want to try and explain this a bit more, and hopefully by the end of this, you, you get a sense of that. So when we talk about treaties, and you hear a lot of people talk about this nation-to-nation -nation, uh, relationship, but a lot of times when you hear about treaties and when it gets to the court case, it's always done in English. The court case is an adversarial system where the actual uh, uh, the, the rules are made by the non-native people and the evidence is actually in the non-natives language and then the evidence also is largely the written record that priests, Indian agents, fur traders and others have written and anthropologists have written down in English. Rare, it started they, since Delgamuk uh, they were to allow more varied sources, especially indigenous sources, meaning uh, wampum belts and scrolls, and as well as songs. So right now, though, we, uh, we still have uh, trouble with uh, the written word being privileged in the court system, as well as in the education system, as you know. Anyway, our, our treaties and our nation-to-nation -nation relationship is more than the written word. It, it, the devices that our ancestors used were wampum, pipes, and metals. And of course, it's more than English. It's in indigenous languages. And then our diplomatic discourse is actually utilizes metaphoric language. And I'll explain this. Whereas the majority of the treaties are written in uh, legalese that isn't easily translated into, into Haudenosaunee languages, into Meshkigo languages, or uh, Anishinaabe languages. And there are, of course, two sides to the story, Anishinaabe Haudenosaunee or Anishinaabe British. So whenever there's two uh, treaty partners or more, there's uh, that many points of view. This is the one that you uh, referred to, the dish with one spoon. And this is uh, Peter Jones, who is uh, pictured there, he says here, the first treaty, can, the first contained a treaty made between the Six Nations and the Ojibwe, 
This treaty was made many years ago when the Great Council was held at the east end of Lake Ontario. The belt was in the form of a dish or bowl in the center, which the chief said represented that the Ojibwe's and Six Nations were all to eat out of the same dish. That is, to have all their game in common. In the center of the bowl were a few white wampum, which represented a beaver's tail, the favorite dish of the Ojibwe's. So right now, the way you, you have heard this, it sounds like everything that this treaty was, everyone had the same understanding. But actually, uh, there seems to be a bit of misunderstanding uh, or different versions, I should say, of this belt now, uh, that people are starting to uh, get a different understanding. There's a Anishinaabe understanding and a Haudenosaunee understanding of this belt. Uh, it, it does mean that the, the land is the dish and that everyone has the right to eat from that dish. But throughout time, uh, the Anishinaabe always said that the Haudenosaunee were not to actually come and trap beaver for their own uh, uh, purposes. They were able to hunt and fish to, to eat. But if they were starting to take furs, then that became a different matter. Anyway, that would be the subject of a different lecture. And uh, but this dish with one spoon actually predated uh, the the Haudenosaunee giving this to the Anishinaabe. Uh, it was it was a, a part of their formation of their league of the Five Nations, and it goes into a lot of their own uh, stories with their peacemaker. This is a belt that was uh, that Peter Jones wrote about that the Haudenosaunee had given the Anishinaabe. And there, Chajaja go, Nadawek, meanwhile, Nishnabek, Geek Chemigadok. The Nishnabek and the Haudenosaunee people fought for a long time. And the Haudenosaunee people fought people on the, their east as well, the Mohegans and the Susquehannock. And uh, they also fought the Nishnabe and the Huron Wendat, the Erie, and the Neutral. Anyway, uh, they, at first, they, they were given guns by the Dutch. And the French weren't giving us guns, so the Haudenosaunee had the upper hand at first. But then we we regrouped, the Anishinaabe regrouped, and then we fought fought them. And then what in our version of this, and of course this will be disputed by the Haudenosaunee, our version is that we sent them back south of the Great Lakes, so south of Lake Ontario and Lake Erie. And, uh, and then this belt here was red, uh, it was entrusted at that time in the 1840s. It was entrusted to a chief at uh, Rama, what is now called Rama First Nation, but is called Minjikining, uh, Yellowhead, Chief Yellowhead or Meskwaki was his name. And at that time as well, the, the belt, he carried the belt and he brought it to a council. And then the, the chiefs of the Haudenosaunee were invited to that meeting and they renewed these belts. And it was John Smoke Johnson and another chief by the name of uh, Buck that read this belt. So how they used to renew these belts is uh, the one who gave the belt would come and they would read that belt. And then it, uh, the one who was the recipient would then read it back. So then you more or less are telling each other you still understand the same, you still have the same understanding as when it was initially given. So this belt on the, on the bottom uh, the, Peter Jones described this belt and he said that the road of peace goes through the length of the belt in the middle, representing peace. And he said there were five marks on it that looked like wigwams. So we don't have the original belt anymore. We don't know where it is. So initially when I had uh, Ken Miracle make this belt, it had five diamonds on it and a white road of peace through it. But then as I thought more about it, uh, uh, I asked my friend Brian Charles of Georgina Island to, to make remake this. I said, a diamond doesn't look like a wigwam. I said, but these hexagons do. And the hexagon also represents the nation, but also represents a council fire. So what we decided was to put that hexagon there and then put the diamond inside. So he said that when the, when the Haudenosaunee read this belt to Yellowhead, and when Yellowhead read it back, 
they both agreed that that first council fire on the left part of the belt was uh, uh, the council fire was held. This council was held and peace was made at Sault Ste. Marie. The next council fire, they said, was our ancestors, meaning the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe, both got together and they ignited a council fire on Manitoulin Island. And they said at Manitoulin Island, they placed there a white fish. So some people take it to mean that it was the species, a tick make, the white fish. But I believe it actually was a fish and that the symbol symbolism of white meaning purity. And that's what they actually say after that this, this white fish represented uh, purity of intentions and uh, clean heartedness towards each other. And they said that that fire would never go out. The next one they said uh, was there was an island in Penetanguishing Bay. And they said our ancestors, the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe, ignited a council fire there. And they said that, they, that the fire would never go out. And they said they placed there a beaver and that this beaver represented wisdom, that all the actions of our ancestors were done in wisdom. They then said that the next uh, council fire that was ignited by our ancestors, both Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe, was ignited at the Narrows, Minjikaning. And that they said that this, the belt and the talk on this belt was entrusted to the chief there. And he said that they both, the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe, had placed there a white deer, white reindeer. And that's called a atik, atikadodem. And they then said that our ancestors also placed there a dish with many ladles. But they said that one of the ladles was for the Haudenosaunee at that time. And they said that the next council fire that was ignited was at the mouth of the Credit River. And beside the mouth of the Credit River was a tall pine tree. And on this tall pine tree, they placed both the ancestors of the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe, placed the white-headed eagle, the bald eagle. And this bald eagle was to represent swiftness as well as uh, watchfulness. And that he was to watch if any ill, win Ill winds uh, blew upon the council fires. They also placed a dish there at the credit and that the right of hunting on the north side of the lake was secured to the Ojibwe's and the Six Nations were not to hunt here, only when they come to smoke the pipe of peace with their Ojibwe brethren. So that's how it how Peter Jones recorded this council in the eight, that happened in the 1840s between the Haudenosaunee and the, and the Anishinaabe. Uh, the Haudenosaunee now have a different understanding of, of this belt, but uh, that's that's to be uh, settled uh, between when they when the Anishinaabek and the Haudenosaunee get together to renew these uh, belts, and people are actually working on renewing these belts uh, soon. Uh, and then they said that uh, the last thing they said was a moon of wampum was tied to the belt near the middle at uh, this moon of wampum represented the sun and they said that all the actions of our ancestors were done under the watchful eyes of the sun meaning the creator so that's what this belt is called so you'll hear some people call this belt the uh the yellow heads belt because he was the caribou clan at the narrows who was entrusted to, to keep this belt but I'm trying to get people to call this the Eternal Council Fire Belt. Because once we start calling it after a specific person, sometimes the descendants end up thinking it's theirs. But it wasn't just their family property. It was actually the, it belonged to the nation. This is another way the chiefs had another belt. And this was up by Sault Ste. Marie. This fella here is Kabalgam, uh, and he was a, uh, a chief uh, living at Marquette, but his father was named Makadegijik, uh, uh, and then also his brother was Wabamimi, and his his brother lived in Sault Ste. Marie. But he says that the, the Odawa, Ojibwe, Potawatomi, and Menominee ended, entered into an alliance. The belt that is pictured at below 
is actually a belt that was collected by Horatio Hale from the Huron Wendat. And that belt is actually at the Pitt Rivers Museum in Oxford, England. It, this isn't the belt that he that Cobb Algum is talking about. But he said that there was a council held at Sault Ste. Marie in the time of my father's grandfather. So three generations, two generations from his time. And he said the pipe and belt used in that council are still at the Sioux in the keeping of my brother Wabamimi, the white dove. The belt is decorated with a stripe of white beads which runs around the middle and is called the road of peace. So that's why I use that belt below. I, I, and then he says the edge, uh, the meaning of the pipe and also of the belt of wampum was that these were a pledge of everlasting peace and bound brothers to keep, to help any one of them that might be in trouble. For by this treaty, the four tribes made an eternal brotherhood. So I think if this were belt were ever found, it likely would have four diamonds on it with that road of peace. So this is a different belt, but I just think it would be the same design. This fella is Andrew Blackbird and his father was named Makadebenese. And uh, his father fought during the War of 1812, but his father was also the Gimal Gigda of the Odawa around Michelin-Mackinac. He wrote, Andrew Blackbird wrote a history of the Odawa and Ojibwe Indians of Michigan. And you can find that uh, resource on the Internet Archive. Uh, just Google Internet Archive and you'll see that. But he said that every tribe of Indians far and near, even as far as Manitoba, deposited their pipe of peace with the head chief of the Odawa nation as a pledge of continual peace and friendship. The importance of the pipe, I just have to stress this, is that uh, here you'll see that uh, in 1760, George Crowan, who was the Deputy Superintendent General of Indian Affairs for the New Northern Superintendency, he was under Sir William Johnson, who I'll explain about later. But he said the Odawa speaker then took up the pipe of peace belonging to the nation and said, brother, to confirm what we have said to you, I give you this peace pipe which is known to all the nations living in this country. And when they see it, they will know it to be the pipe of peace belonging to our nation. Then he delivered the pipe. So each different nation actually had decorated their pipes in different ways. But right now, I can't tell the difference, but uh, back then they would have known which pipe belonged to which nation. And just to show this, uh, in 1764, although it says Takamawan, uh, that's actually the Ojibwe people, that's what they were called out by uh, Lake of the Woods area back in the mid-18th century. And that name, that name actually got subsumed by the name Ojibwe. Shage, that means a heron, but they put crane. Crane is a jijok. Anyway, he says there, when he came to Niagara with this pipe, Shage said, brother, this pipe is sent by all our chiefs. We were obliged several times along the road to hoist this pipe up in our canoe to prevent our being scratched on our way. We now leave it here with you that you that it may be used whenever any of our people come here and then think of the friendship subsisting between them and the English, then lay down the pipe. So at that time, these pipes, you see they had eagle feathers on them and they had uh, woodpecker heads affixed to them as well, as well as deer hair and uh, wampum, uh, strings of wampum. But the, uh, if you can imagine at this, at this uh, ceremony in Niagara, many different nations actually brought their pipe and they deposited it there with uh, Sir William Johnson. Oops. So at that time, yeah, this is a map of uh, uh, 1760 and 1763, as well as after the American Revolution, and you know what happened then. But anyway, uh, Sir William Johnson had actually asked uh, the Western Confederacy to enter into the Covenant Chain. And that's what that uh, this wampum belt is called uh, that I'll show you. 
Anyway, the arrangement with that covenant chain was that uh, they would always get together and polish this chain. And the chain actually was a, as a metaphor for the alliance and the strength of that alliance. It is said that the, when the Mohawk met the Dutch, they actually used a rope to tie themselves together, to bound themselves together. Then they said that rope was easily broken. So they decided that they would tie themselves together with an iron chain to show how strong their friendship was. Then they said that anybody can make uh, iron and iron readily rusts. So they said, we want to show you how valuable our friendship is. So they made a silver covenant chain. And they said, and that we know that uh, silver can tarnish. So we pledge that every year we'll, we'll get together time to time and polish the chain. And this was a metaphor to actually state that they will then uh, smooth over any disagreements. Now, of course, they say we're going to have a ADR, Alternative Dispute Resolution. But back then, it was actually get together to polish the, polish the chain. So here, what was causing a disruption to the chain was that the settlers were coming in and, and moving in without having a treaty. And they were taking land, cutting down trees, and uh, taking resources without compensating our ancestors. So this caused a, a good deal of, uh, of uh, tension. Sir William Johnson then went to Detroit to actually get the Western nations to enter into that covenant chain. And one of the things that he said was, brethren, I can with confidence assure you that is not at present, neither hath it been his majesty's intentions to deprive any nations of Indians of their just property by taking possession of any lands. So he's saying that uh, the land belongs to the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee and Shawnee and all the other nations. And that's what was said in the Royal Proclamation. But now lawyers talk about it in a different way because they talk about uh, what, what uh, the, the frame of reference is British law. But here what I'm trying to show and talk about is Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee understanding and law. So here, he brought out this covenant chain, and that was 1761. And of course, in 1760, as you know, the, the British defeated the French. and then But the British did not defeat the Haudenosaunee. The, of course, that was their allies. Nor did the British defeat the Anishinaabe. And they were told that in no uncertain terms have you defeated us. But here, this is the uh, General Amherst ended up... Uh, curtailing the presents that they would deliver each year. So they used to deliver presents for using and living on our territory. Anyway, uh, Amherst uh, curtailed those presents and this uh, raised the ire of the Anishinaabe and the Haudenosaunee. So there are two leading chiefs. It's often called Pontiac's War, but there was also a Seneca chief named Gayas Sota who was also influential in that so-called uprising. I don't really call it a rebellion or a uprising. Uh, I haven't found an adequate word. Uh, the reason I don't call it an uprising is because it makes it sound like we were under them, under their rule, but we weren't. Anyway, the Pontiac uh, uh, and Gayasota and their young men uh, decided to show that the, the arrangements weren't ideal for them. So Sir William Johnson then said that he would, he wrote to his superiors and he said, we, I, I suspect that he says it would be cheaper to conquer their prejudices by entering into a treaty of defensive and offensive alliance. And we should use the forms that they most readily recognize, that being a large wampum belt with intelligible figures thereon. And he said they, that he said that they, they don't read and write, but they use wampum to uh, renew their uh, engagements. So that's why they made this covenant chain wampum belt. And he says, you have now been here several days during which time we have frequently met to renew and strengthen our engagements. And you have made so many promises of your friendship and attachment to the English that there now only remains for us to exchange the great belt of the covenant chain that we may not forget our mutual engagements. And that is the covenant chain up there, 1764, and that was given to the, uh, he, 
So William Johnson tried to give it to the Ojibwe, but the Ojibwe said it should uh, of uh, the Ojibwe of Sault Ste. Marie, but the Ojibwe chief of Sault Ste. Marie said this should be entrusted to the Odawa and Michilimackinac. And again, at that time, uh, Sir William Johnson said to all the assembled chiefs of the Odawa Chippewas of Toronto, of Lake Huron, Lake Superior, the Nipissings, Algonquins, Menominees, and Odawas of La Bay, the Six Nations, and the Indians of Canada. Brethren re reduced all of Canada and of consequence became possessed of all the outposts which the French governor granted us by the capitulation. Although we were numerous and able, we did not attempt anything against you. They often sent armies against you, they being the French, killed many of your people and meditated a design of possessing themselves of your country. So here he's actually stretching the truth, uh, kind of like Trump. We never attempted the one nor intended the other. But so he's saying here, the land, again, he's saying the land is yours. Our people and Sir William Johnson actually knew this metaphoric language. And so he ended up saying at, at an earlier conference, he says, I don't want your whole mat, I just a piece of it. That's what Sir William Johnson had said to the Western Confederacy. But whenever they met in, uh, uh, in councils, that's what they would talk about, the mat. And like how we talk about that dish, we also talk about the mat being a territory. Because the mat is actually back then where you where you lay down, where you sat, and where you slept. So it was a reference to uh, your territory. And in our language, we say Nakanesh or Pakwayashk for a, for a mat. The Odawa chief at Mishlamakana in 1785, with a pipe in his head, he asked you, my father, to smoke from it. We show you the alliances that we have made with our different father, Sir William Johnson. That is why we present you today the mat of peace. And again, the mat there in that case, he's referring to the, uh, the covenant chain belt that was given to them by Sir William Johnson. So he referred not only to the mat, uh, uh, the physical mat, that picture there that you see, but he also referred to wampum belts as mats. This is a painting of uh, Johnson Hall, which were, where Sir William Johnson lived. And then they, it depicts a, a, a council, and you see that fire in the middle. And you see a desk, and you see a, a scribe there taking down the speeches. Now, if you can imagine, uh, you teachers, uh, if we had a Haudenosaunee person here speaking in either Mohawk or Cayuga, and then uh, myself speaking in Ojibwe, and then another person speaking Shawnee, then you would have uh, these people sitting around uh, the council fire and then an, an interpreter speaking on behalf of those people uh, and then also having to translate the message. So you'd see how long this, uh, this peace treaty actually took, this treaty took. But these are the belts that were given at that time according to the Anishinaabe, that, uh, that covenant chain belt and then that 20, what we call the 24 nations belt. And this 24 nations belt was that there were 12 of those were the Eastern Confederacy, which included the Haudenosaunee, the Six Nations. The 12 other 12 were the Western Confederacy, which included the Ojibwe, Odawa, the Sauk, Fox, Menominee, the Sioux, the Huron, Wendat, and uh, Miami and others. But that one island there, some say it, it represents the rock at Quebec at the left end of that belt on top. Uh, another say it represents all of North America. And then at the, uh, at the right end of the belt or the east end of that belt represents a ship that is laden or full with the presents that were promised to be delivered every year. And that ship, they said, guy, we call the uh, Gajimanawa. Your belt will, I mean, your boat will never be empty. That's what they said. And uh, that's what they promised us. And then it would always be full. And binding all 24 of those nations, they said, is the strong cord of friendship. And they said, if anything is ever lacking, all you have to do is uh, and that means just tug on that rope 
and I'll know that something is lacking and I'll look in the ship and I'll see whatever is missing and I'll load it I'll put it in that boat and then all of you get together all nations we and then all of you pull that boat and it'll come right to, to your shores and be full of all that you need and you'll never sink in poverty they said so through time, this was first 1764, but like I said, 1761, it was first extended at Detroit, but of course uh, Amherst ruined that. So that belt, we don't know where that belt is that was uh, given to them at that time. But these are the belts that were entrusted, the top two were entrusted to the Odawa and Michelin Mackinac. The third belt is, was given to the Shawnee, and it represented the uh, their alliance with the Western Confederacy as well, because at that time, the Shawnee were the head warriors. And then Tecumseh brought that belt out in 1811 and showed it at Fort uh, uh, Malden at Amherstburg prior to the War of 1812. And then before the War of 1812 as well, in 1806, a delegation of uh, Odawa and Potawatomi brought their war pipe to Malden, and they were ready to go to war against the Americans. So they were asking the British to actually supply them with ammunition and weapons. But then the, the British didn't want to go to war yet. They weren't ready. So that's why they gave that 1807 belt to have their young men sit down. And then Francis Gore, that's what FG means. In 1808, he gave an even bigger belt. And uh, that heart is in the middle. And that represents, of course, the white heart of a, a, a purity and tensions. And then that last bottom belt is called the Pledge of Nations. And this was given after, after the War of 1812 ended. And it, it has to do also with the Jay Treaty. Here that belt at the top, Ken Miracle uh, is the one who told me this. When I used to talk about this belt, uh, I used to talk about, uh, read it linearly, like how left to right, how we read and write now. And that uh, I knew that the diamond at the left edge of the belt was incomplete. And then the diamond or the chain link at the right end of the belt was also incomplete. And I used to say that means that it represents that this belt actually had something there prior. And then also that in the future, it will go on. But then Ken Miracle was told by his elders he said, they said, put those two ends together, like in a circle. And then that's what it actually completes. You see that they complete each other and they form a circle. So those, uh, that this belt represents, of course, uh, uh, that the Anishinaabe and the uh, British are equals and that their nation to nation relationship, that's what this represents. But what I wanna hope to instill in you is that it actually represents more than that. This belt actually represents the British recognition of our Aboriginal title, of our land, and it also they, that they represent and recognize and affirm our right to hunt and fish all in this land. And then also that they uh, paid us for services during various wars. So these council fires that were struck in our area, they, these were actually also struck at uh, Montreal and uh, Quebec, also Kingston and at York and Fort Niagara, of course. But the presents were delivered at Michelin-Mackinac for the Western Confederacy between 1764 and 1798. St. Joseph's Island, 1798 to 1812. And that, of course, represents when the, after the American Revolution that Michilimackinac became American territory. And then after, during the War of 1812, the, uh, the Confederated Anishinaabe Nations and the Sioux took over Fort Michilimackinac with some assistance from the British. So during the War of 1812, they retook Michilimackinac and that's where the presents were delivered. And then after the War of 1812, they ended up moving the Council Fire to Drummond Island. But the, the, uh, after the, the War of 1812, 
they didn't settle on the boundary of between the Americas, Amer United States of America and, and Canada. And then in 1828, uh, it was decided that Drummond Island was uh, American territory. So they ended up uh, putting the Council of Fire briefly at St. St. Joseph's Island again, and then at Penetanguishene from 1830 to 1835. And then they delivered the presents and ignited the Council of Fire between the British and Western Confederacy at Mantuani between 1836 to 1854. These are the types of presents that they gave every year from 1764 to 1854. So you see the present list is more plentiful in 1822 than it is in 1854. But what I wanna show you is that the Anishinaabek called this support, but also warmth. And you see they got all kinds of cloth, but also blankets. And they also got sewing thread and uh, combs but the important part here is they got uh, butcher knives, tobacco, ball, gunpowder, shot, worm, gun worms, and gun flints. So they were giving us the means to do our hunting. And then they also, the other important part is they gave us tobacco. And like I talked about at the beginning with that pipe, how important that is. But each year the British came to our country and they entered into a council with us and they feasted with us. They ate with us around the council fire and they delivered presents to us and they smoked tobacco and we burnt tobacco together. That was what made this a sacred alliance, a sacred relationship. They also gave us extra articles or extra gifts, which were flags, chief's guns, which were better than the common guns. And then also rifles, which were also uh, more accurate than the other guns. They gave us kettles and they gave us fishing hooks, cod lines, net thread, and Russia or Scotch sheeting. So note, they also gave us net thread and cod lines to do our fishing and hooks. So again, this is, you, you hear and see in the news what's going on with the uh, Mi'kmaq and what's going on in Mi'kma'ki right now. And the British are transgressing and uh, this, uh, this alliance that they made, because the Abenaki and the Mi'kmaq were part of this as well. Uh, so here they're breaking their own treaties again. And uh, when we went to court uh, for this Robinson Huron annuity case, uh, the Canadian government and the Ontario government were saying that this isn't a treaty. The Treaty of Niagara isn't a treaty, it's a Congress. Furthermore, they said, if it's a treaty, where's the written document? And uh, we, we say the document is the, the wampum belt. Anyway, the other thing that they had said at that time, there's no clauses in this treaty. And again, that's why I started this presentation off with Sir William Johnson saying mutual engagements or clauses. What's the difference? So again, now the lawyers, when they fight about over, over court cases, they look for clauses and legalese. They don't look for our evidence of wampum belts, metals, pipes, and uh, any documents written in our language. So in 1836, uh, Sir Francis Bondhead came to Manitoulin and he actually entered into a treaty, but he wasn't supposed to. He was just there to tell them, uh, they gathered in Nishnavik that uh, they were, he wanted to discontinue the presence that was what his, he was, Sir Francis Bondhead was ordered, uh, uh, I mean hired, because he was he successfully cut costs in Britain. So he was brought here to cut costs. And one of the ones, one of the cost saving measures was to stop delivering presents to the Anishinaabek. Anyway, Siganok pulled these wampum belts out and he recited them. And Sir Francis Bondhead was so impressed that he said, let's make a treaty. And that's when they made the 1836 Mantuaning Treaty. And if, as far as I know, it's the only treaty that re references the 1764 Treaty of Niagara. And here's what the, this is, this quote is actually taken from an 1851 uh, uh, statement by a, a Signoc. He says that Sir William Johnson had said, my children, I clothe your land. You see that wampum before me, the body of my words. In this, the spirit of my words shall remain. It shall never be removed. 
the Indians being my adopted children, their life shall never sink in poverty. So that's the oral tradition of those wampum belts and the promises and the mutual engagements that the British entered into with us. And now, of course, you, as you know, some of your teachers, you see that currently our people have been impoverished and that we have to fight, uh, fight that poverty. And we're trying to fight that poverty and get more of a, a share of the, of the benefits from the land. Anyway, that treaty, the first line of that treaty, it says, 70 snow seasons have now passed away since we met in council at the Crooked Place, Niagara at which time and place your great father, the king, and the Indians of North America tied their hands together by the wampum of friendship. So that, to me, is the first time they actually talked about this uh, in, a, in an actual treaty that's written. Here's Rigoa again in 1852. He says, Father, we heard your words and we believe when you said, you see that sun above us who daily shines to light and warm us? You see those green leaves which open out beneath his rays? You see that grass which clothes the earth? Those waters which flow from the highlands towards the sea? Well, whilst these things live, your presence shall live. Can it be that this is forgotten? So again, uh, when I was going do, doing my undergrad, I thought that that phrase, as long as the grass, as long as the sun shines, the grass grows and the rivers flow. I thought that was a phrase for out west. I didn't know that we knew it too, and that we abided by it. This is Captain Badosh, who is a Rice Lake, uh, Mississauga, Anishinaabe chief of the Crane Clan. And he also wrote a petition about these uh, presents. And this is what he said, the, what the interpreter said. Our great father is very glad and thanks us very much. And he makes the same promise as the governor did to our grandchildren long ago. Below, as long as the sun, as, as we see the sun, and as long as the river flows, the grass grows, that the supplies of clothing and blankets, etc., from the government shall never be stopped, as long as this would last, as long as we live. So the document the, the, in the archives has a handwritten document has a lot of these words stroked out in English, but there is an Ojibwe document there. So I, I transliterated it to how we write today. That these things would not end. They would never end. Shkwase means something comes to an end. Shkwase snok, it doesn't end. And mi jask is that grass, and zibawan are the rivers, and the gizis is the sun. So they knew this as well, the, the Mississaugas of the Rice Lake area. This is the medal that was given at that time in 1764, and it was a mnemonic device. And there's the Tree of Peace and the Nishnabe and the and the British are smoking under that tree of peace in the shade. And there behind them is a fire. And then you see that uh, on the clasp of that metal is that uh, pipe and the eagle wing. Here, this was a petition after the, the British discontinued the presence in 1854. So they wrote numerous petitions to actually get those reinstated. But this was the chiefs of the uh, North Shore of Lake Huron that wrote a petition. Great chief, we humbly ask and entreat your excellency to have that sacred friendship renewed as we do in our part by respecting our rights to the lands, hunting and fishing, which the great spirit has given us. And that was the 1870 petition, but they wrote again in 1879 and they said we, that they wanted to go to England to lay before the government the treaties made in the year 1764 and 1786 by the Canadian governors under direction of George III, King of Britain and Ireland, with the full power to explain the meaning of the wampums what accompanies the deputation. So here the important point again is that these belts, the chiefs referred to them and used them about respecting the rights to the lands as well as hunting and fishing. 
This is a petition in 1879, a continuation, and they said, they were told by their great father, the king, that he would not always live to look after them and their rights, that after his decease, efforts might be made by evil disposed persons to deprive them of their presence. And if they were ever so unfortunate as to lose them, all they would have to do to, would be to present the treaty and the medal, which I give them to my successor in the throne of England, and both the covenant and the promise would be speedily and faithfully carried out and the presence restored to them. So I just wanted to show that these, this wampum belt and the metal together actually has, is more important and uh, is more than just an heirloom. Both of them are just more than heirlooms. They actually represent our, our understanding of our relationship with the, the with the crown. So it represents independence, allies, and friendship, or sovereignty. It also represents land ownership, or Aboriginal title, but it also represents protection, fiduciary responsibility, that's called now. It also represents support and warmth. These presents were to be given to us annually. And then it also represents that hunting and fishing, as well as our right to uh, harvest timber and in the McMoggy case, uh, the fish and the lobsters from the ocean. That's it on the PowerPoint. I know I went over time a bit, but we'll see if we can handle some questions. Uh, somebody's speaking, but they're on mute. Good, Becca. You're still okay, muted. You're still muted. <laughs> there, I think. We can't hear you. Did you hear me or did I just talk for an hour for nothing? No, no, no. no. <laughs> we heard oh. you. <laughs> we, 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 heard, we heard you. <laughs> okay. There's uh, one question that came up in the Q&A. Um, and we have a few minutes before we uh, we um, uh, lose the Zoom, so we may as well take questions. Um, I think there's a lot to unpack there, a lot of history you shared. So, Miigwech. The, um, the question is, there are many land acknowledgements that the newcomers have been invited into the dish with one spoon treaty. I heard one last week that said that they were invited into the dish with one spoon with the Treaty of Niagara uh, and as asking if this is true. I haven't seen um, like at the at the Niagara. I haven't seen the dish specifically referenced, but I I know I was talking to uh, uh, a friend of mine, Rick Hill, who's also studied these things. He's a Seneca fellow, and he said that at one point Sir William Johnson had told the Haudenosaunee that he br he brought the dish inside the fort. And that's what uh, he, he, he says it represents. So I, I'm looking at it a bit more. When uh, some people have said that the, the British, well, the, any newcomer, I guess, has been uh, invited into the dish with one spoon, I personally uh, haven't seen that. And I also would say no. And the reason I'd say no is because of our current relationship with, uh, let's say, Ontario Hunt uh, Federation of Anglers and Hunters, where all these game laws, to me, I, I would think that's a dangerous thing because uh, the Ontario government has actually uh, instituted all these game laws without consulting us and actually impinging and uh, our hunting and fishing rights. So I wouldn't want to do that. That's basically what I'm saying. I can't say that I've seen evidence of it, but I know I trust Rick Hill's scholarship. And that when he said that uh, the British brought that dish into the fort is uh, how I heard him say it. And then the French governor uh, in 1701 did uh, give these belts out to the different nations and uh, talked about that dish with one spoon to all these different nations. So it's 
That's a big question that deserves a whole different uh, discussion, especially when we talk about the uh, fishing game laws that were entered, uh, were enacted afterward. And uh, the chiefs, as I tried to show here with this wampum belt, actually said that our hunting and fishing rights were were kept. And especially when you look at the Williams Treaty stuff, and then uh, if people, non-native people started saying they're part of the dish with one spoon, that means that they have the right to go and hunt and fish. Do you have time to take uh, one or two more, Alan? Yeah, I do. Okay. Um, so the next question uh, is from Jean-Francois Caron, and he asked, uh, they ask, um, so as part of the resolution here to resume these presents, uh, how would the mutual engagement be modernized if we wanted to do this? as bronze kettles aren't quite as valuable as in the 1700s. The, the other thing is they did, there was a movement to try and actually get those, that value of those presents, because the budget uh, for that, as like I said, bond head was to cut those costs. Uh, and, uh, and then Sir William Johnson, when he, when he entered into this, he says it would be cheaper to uh, conquer their prejudices by entering into this uh, alliance, this treaty, and then also to uh, give them presents annually, and he said, uh, "We don't, we'll, we don't, will gradually uh, cut them back, and uh, with this gradual dim diminution, will eventually discontinue them." So that was his plan all along, but the Anishinaabeg didn't look at it that way. That these promises were made forever. So part of it isn't it isn't so much uh, the value of them they were valuable, but a part of it is actually if you if you know about the uh, Nishnabe people like we actually when we we want to learn a song from an elder, we'll we'll give them cloth, and then also uh, if you have other bigger requests, sometimes you take a blanket, and other gifts, as well as that tobacco. So what I'm trying to uh, show people with this is to show that the British actually gave us on our terms the way to actually enter into a relationship by actually giving us tobacco and cloth and then the kettles and utensils were also uh, assisting us in actually cooking that as well as well as making maple syrup and so those were were valuable as well and you we could look at how that actually would, would be enacted in the modern day, but some may actually just say uh, commuted to money. Uh, and there was a movement uh, uh, late in the mid 19th century where they actually thought about just making these uh, payments in money to, to Nishnabek and the Haudenosaunee. And, uh, but we, we don't know where, where that ended up. I don't know where that ended up, I should say. Um, Shannon Van Every asks, "How far how far back can we date wampum belts?" Uh, they they dated back to pre-contact. The use of wampum beads to make manufacture of them, and then the Haudenosaunee say that their uh, their founding belt, the uh, the Iowata belt, is uh, predates the the coming of the uh, newcomers, and uh, and then archaeologically, they, they do show that there were beads, but uh, uh, certainly when the newcomers came, the production of beads, it was usually strings then earlier because it was so hard to make the beads. But uh, once they started uh, mass producing them uh, and they found out that they were uh, valuable, the Dutch actually started mass producing these beads. And then that's when they started making these big belts and they got bigger. Uh, in the 17th century. And that was kind of the heyday of these belts was the 18th century, late 17th, early 18th century where all these belts were being made and uh, exchanged. And uh, Fred asked, uh, why are there no treaties in Quebec? That's a misnomer. There are, there are treaties there. And if you look at the 1701 
treaty. That's and that's the thing that's it was done with wampum, and so that's why people say there are no treaties there, when actually there's a lot of wampum, and that to to me that's that's a treaty. But after they they didn't expand north, so there is a the treaty uh, James Bay Treaty. That was signed, I think, 1975. Well, I think we're uh, uh, running out of time. I'm going to hand it over to uh, Liv to, to say thank you and close things up for us. Thank you, Becca. I'd just like to say uh, Chimi Gwech Allen for coming and talking to us this evening about um, treaties and talking to our um, pre-service teachers about um, all of the things that we discussed tonight. Um, we really appreciate you sharing your knowledge with us and we're very thankful for that. So um, Chimi Gwech, um, and I wanted to say thank you as well for everybody who came and attended the webinar. Um, it was a great discussion and I learned a lot myself. So I hope others learned um, valuable uh, knowledge that they'll take forward as well. So um, Chimi Gwech and um, Bama P to everybody who came tonight. Thank you all for taking the time to listen. I know it was a lot, but uh, hopefully you can unpack it.